Let's pray together. Father, we worship you this morning because what you have done through Christ's death and resurrection has changed everything and has put firm ground beneath our feet and given us a place of refuge where we can go even when the world ends. Lord, we pray that you would use this passage before us to fill our minds with your glory and with your power and to make us people who are able to be still and know that you are God that you are a strong refuge, an ever-present help. And Lord, we ask that you would do it in Jesus' name and by the power of your Spirit. Amen. On December 26, 2004, there was an earthquake that was between 9.1 and 9.3 on the Richter scale out in the middle of the ocean, and that earthquake resulted in a tsunami, waves as high as 100 feet crashing onto the shore in Southeast Asia. The, the earthquake was so severe that it actually displaced the North Pole by 2.5 centimeters. The, the, the shift in the earth was that large. Uh, it, cha- it slightly changed the shape of the earth. It affected the, the rotation of the earth Um, ever so slightly increasing the rate at which it turns, and it actually shortened the day by 2.68 microseconds. And in 14 countries, the waves of this tsunami resulted in the deaths of over 230,000 people. It wasn't the end of the world for all creation, but for those people, it was like the end of the world. I would invite you to open your Bible this morning and look with me at Psalm 46, and we will consider together this psalm that is about the end of the world. And this is Easter Sunday, and Psalm 46 was written prior to the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, but the fulfillment of what is stated in this psalm very much depends on the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And so as we approach this psalm, let me, let me sort of preview it and, and overview it very quickly for you. You'll notice that at the end of verse 3, you see the word selah, and then at the end of verse 7, again, you see this word selah, and then again at the end of verse 11, the word selah. And those three instances of this word selah, which we don't exactly know what that word means, but nevertheless, it, it marks out the three Uh, movements of thought in Psalm 46. And so we can say that there are three sections of this psalm, and in all three sections, the most prominent, the most prominent message of the psalm is that God is with us. God is with his people. So look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. And then look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us, The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Uh, The first of these three sections, in verses 1 through 3, envisions a time when all creation, the land, the mountains, and the seas, experience what we could call an apocalyptic, and that word just means end of the world, end of time, that all creation experiences an apocalyptic uproar. And as creation is unmade, think about that. God made the world, and in verses 1 through 3 here, he's unmaking the world. As creation is unmade, God's people find refuge and help in him. In the second section, in verses 4 through 7, there's a depiction of the city of God. And the city of God is strong and secure because of God's presence and protection, even as nations crumble and kingdoms totter and the earth itself melts. In the last section, 
in verses 8 through 11, there is this summons, this call for everyone within the sound of the psalmist's voice to behold the Lord's wondrous works because his judgment has put an end to war, destroyed the implements of war, and filled the world with God's glory. So Psalm 46 teaches us that God is our refuge, and this outline is on your bulletin, in verses 1 through 3, when the creation is unmade. Verses 4 through 7, when the city of God is made glad. And then verses 8 through 11, when the peace is established. This is a comforting psalm. And the reason that this psalm is comforting because, is, is because we have been looking at this whole section of the Psalter, and we started back in Psalm 42, where the psalmist repeatedly talks about how his soul is cast down. He's asking himself even, why are you cast down, O my soul? And we were, when we were in Psalm 42, we saw that one of the problems the psalmist has is that he wants to be in Jerusalem. He wants to be in the city of God so that he can worship the Lord. Well, in Psalm 46, what's he describing? He's describing the city of God. And in between Psalms 42 and 46, the king has come in Psalm 45. And we saw last week that when the king comes, he triumphs over his enemies, he establishes his throne securely, and then he initiates a covenant with his bride. And, and so there's a movement of thought here that goes from longing and yearning to be back in God's presence, back in God's land, worshiping the Lord himself. And then the king comes in Psalm 45, and then we have this psalm, Psalm 46, that celebrates the establishment, the final establishment of the city of God. And that's going to issue in Psalms 47 and 48 in these celebratory psalms, worshiping the Lord for all that he has done. So I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of suffering in, in this room, and there's a lot of anxiety. There, there, there are people whose situations are, are not what you'd want them to be, some of you are facing health difficulties. Some of you have, have endured awful losses. Others are facing uncertain futures, and you, you don't know exactly what awaits you. But one of the things that this psalm can do for us is, is fast forward us to the end of all things and allow us to reflect on how, how we will feel at that moment. And, and with that thought in mind, look with me at verses 1 through 3 here and what the psalmist says as he describes the end of the world. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. This is a confession. This is an assertion of something that is true. In a time of trouble, the place we go for refuge the place we go for strength or power is to the Lord himself. And, and because of this, now, I think there's a dynamic here between verses 1 and 2 that works like this. We've experienced this all our lives, haven't we? Those of us who walk with the Lord, those of us who know God, those of us who regularly look to God's word, we regularly experience God's help and strength and we find him to be a refuge, a hiding place. And because that's the way we've lived, when the end comes, and the end is going to come for every one of us. The end is coming. Things may seem happy, hunky-dory, sun shining outside, but a day will come when it's going to be like the tsunami has just washed over all the earth. And, and because the psalmist has walked with God, look at what he says in verse 2. Therefore... Because I've known God as my refuge and strength and my help in trouble, therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. This scene is the unmaking of the world. The earth is changed, the mountains it's as though the mountains have come, become uh, unhitched from their foundations and those that are right there on the ledge of the ocean, they begin to wobble and then they fall into the heart of the sea. 
right off the surface of the earth. And you can imagine, you can imagine the tsunamis and the earthquakes that would follow something like that. This imagery is exactly what's described over in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 8, chapter 11, chapter 16. In chapter 8, there's this mountain that is thrown into the, into the mighty ocean. And then in both chapters 11 and 16, there are these huge earthquakes as the earth is being changed at the coming of God. And these verses declare that the people of God are going to find the Lord himself to be a strong refuge, an ever-present help when the world as we know it comes to an end. This is a cosmic disruption described here in verses 1 through 3 that describes the final end of history when the just displeasure of God, righteous indignation of the holy God, purges all creation of everything that has defiled the world that he made pure. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're a visitor. And maybe you think something like this. I know these Christians. They're, these Christians are sinners too. And this guy seems to be saying to you, which I am, that on the day of God's wrath, God's just displeasure and righteous indignation is going to be visited against everyone who's committed sin. Well, then how are the Christians exempt? Why do they get to go to the Lord as a refuge? Why, why are they hidden in this strong place that's an ever-present help when God's wrath falls? Why don't the Christians suffer it also? That's a good question. And, and the psalmist is not addressing it here in Psalm 46, but we've seen it in other psalms. We saw it at the end of Psalm 30, 34, and we, we see hints of the reason, the answer to that question in Psalm 22, where this righteous sufferer is forsaken by God on behalf of others. And then there are these other things in the Bible, like the flood that I mentioned earlier, where the wrath of God comes over the earth, and yet Noah is delivered. We can say similar things about the exodus from Egypt, where God's wrath falls on Egypt, but God's people, they're hidden from all those plagues. And ultimately, ultimately the answer to this question comes in Romans chapter 3, where Paul talks about how God put Jesus forward as a sacrifice of propitiation. And Paul explains that this was to show that God was just, God was righteous. God was a judge who upheld the law because what God was going to do is God was going to show mercy to everybody that's identified by faith with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Everybody that has trusted in Jesus and confessed and repented of their sin and then been identified with Christ by faith. All those people, God righteously, justly forgives so that when his wrath falls, they go to him as their refuge and they are delivered. Now look at Psalm 46, verse 4. The psalmist writes in the second section, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Maybe you've Maybe you've been to Jerusalem. Maybe you've studied its, its geography. Uh, either way, if you've, if you've looked into this at all, you know that there's no river that runs through the city of Jerusalem. You know, there's a river that borders Louisville. There, there are other cities that have rivers running. Not Jerusalem. There is no river in the city of Jerusalem. However, there are several passages in the Bible, like the one that Chris Birch read earlier in the service, that describe an end-time scene when God is going to make the world new and God is going to make it so that a river flows right out of the very temple itself. That's the river that the psalmist has in view here. It's in a number of passages in the Old Testament. It's also in the passage in the New Testament that Denny read. This is the river of Psalm 46 verse 4, the one that God is going to make after the purging, apocalyptic, end-time destruction that precedes the 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 renewal of all things, the new heavens and new earth that, that uh, is being described in this psalm. So here in, in verse 4 we read, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And um, this, this word streams is the same word that you find in Psalm 1. And in Psalm 1 what's being described there is, is a blessed man. 
And this blessed man, he doesn't walk in the way of the wicked or, or stand in the way of sinners or seat or sit himself in the seat of mockers. Instead, he delights in the law of the Lord. And then he's compared to a tree that's planted by streams of water. So I think that these two texts are interacting with one another. And when we read of the streams that make glad the city of God here, we're to think of the streams by which that tree is planted. And, and from these two things, I would say this. The, the, the presence and the word of God is what sustains us and gives us joy and life now. And the presence and the word of God is what will sustain us and give us life in the new heavens and the new earth. The, the same presence of God, the same, the same speaker who speaks comfort and love and peace to his people will speak to us then. The Jerusalem of old was the place of God's temple. And, and this new Jerusalem will be his city. Look at the rest of verse 4 here. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. This is where God dwells. This psalm anticipates the day when what Revelation 21 verse 3 says will be announced. Revelation 21 verse 3 says this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Now, it's really interesting in view of the way that you've got this statement here in Psalm 46, talking about the city of God where God is going to dwell with his people, and it's preceded by Psalm 45, where you've got this wedding scene where the king of Israel is being married to to his bride. And and the reason I think that's interesting is because the previous verse in Revelation 21 describes the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So you you see the sequence, right? Marriage scene in Revelation 45, new city, Revelation 40. um, Psalm 45, Psalm 46. Revelation 21, 2, bride, wedding scene. Revelation 21, 3, uh, city of God, place where God dwells with his people. Same same sequence. This is the holy habitation of the Most High. Then verse 5, we read, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. This is what we saw back in verse 2. We will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved. Well, the city of God, Mount Zion, which the Lord loves, that mountain is not going to be moved. What this is saying is that when the world comes to an end, when, when the sky falls, when the sun explodes, when the earth gives way beneath your feet, there is a safe place to stand. It is within the city of God where God is refuge and strength and ever-present help. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. And then the next line of verse 5 says, God will help her when morning dawns. So God's presence is going to stabilize his people even as the, the ground beneath their feet gives way. And then this reference to morning dawns it, it brings up the sunrise, which is a powerful image of hope, isn't it? The, the, the sunrise, it, it, it suggests a time when people are going to come awake after sleep. And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah 26, 19, Daniel 12, 2, and other passages describe death as sleep and describe resurrection from the dead as coming awake. We even sang such imagery this morning. So I think that this this idea that God is going to help her when morning dawns, this this is getting at the time when the dead are going to be raised, when the dawn of the life of the new creation, that that new morning 
is going to come and the sleepers in death will be raised to life to walk with the Lord, to dwell in his city. On that day, the wicked will be judged and the repenters will be hidden from God's justice in God's mercy. The next verse, Psalm 46.6, it's like, it's like the cameraman moves from the city of God and he puts his lens on the rebellious of the world who are in uproar as the world comes to an end. And we read here in verse 6, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. So the rest of the world, people that don't know God, they will have no refuge on that day. If you're a believer here this morning, I would urge you to let this land on you in all its fullness. When the world comes to an end, those who do not know Christ are going to face the almighty, everlasting wrath of God. So, so these people, they don't want to hear from us right now. Maybe you experienced like I did this yesterday. You knock on their door, they come to the door, you begin to tell them the best news in the world. And they are, they are communicating you, to you with every vibe that they can send out of their being. Leave me alone and go away. I have no interest in what you have to say. And maybe sometimes it's even worse than that. But this is so important that we must tell them. We must continue to look for ways to, to undermine that resistance. We must continue to try to think about questions that would provoke them to reconsider. We must continue to appeal to them because this is the only way to be saved. The only place of refuge will be the Lord himself on that day. And if you're, you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus, or maybe, um, you know, you, you're here this morning and you're, you're not a believer in Jesus and you're so sick of your family members continue, continuing to try to tell you this message, this is why they're telling you this message. They care about you. They don't want you to face God's wrath. When Psalm 46.6 says, He utters His voice, the earth melts. We see that the same word that made the world is going to melt the world. Think about this. God's vowels, his consonants, his syllables, his lexemes and phrases and syntactical constructions and sentences, all that caused protons and neutrons to form atoms and atoms to grow into molecules and on the power of God's almighty utterance the earth and the universe sprang into being at his word that same utterance which caused all those things to congeal and come together is going to cause them to dissolve he will utter his voice and the earth will melt the God who revealed himself to Abraham, the God who changed Jacob's name to Israel, he is the one who is with his people. He is the one who will utter the word. Look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of hosts. Hosts, that speaks of angelic armies. The Lord of hosts. The Lord, there are passages in the Bible that, that describe the Lord as, as being surrounded by thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. You, you cannot be too imaginative as you try to envision the scope of the field or, or the, the, the dace, the, the, the throne room that would contain those who surround the Lord himself. The Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts is with us. Maybe you remember that scene in the Old Testament where the prophet of God is seeing the, the enemy armies come toward the Lord's people, come against the Lord. And, and then uh, his, his servant says, oh, look how many they are. And the prophet says, open his eyes, Lord. And the Lord grants him sight. And this servant of the prophet beholds hosts upon hosts of angelic armies ready to defend the people of God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob 
is our fortress. A fortress is a place that you go and, and that place holds fast as the enemy attacks. That's what the Lord, God himself, is for us. So God is our refuge when the creation is unmade. He's our place of safety when the city is made glad. And he's our home when the peace is established, as we see in verse 8 and following. This invitation is, is issued in Psalm 46, 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. These mighty deeds that he's accomplished. Everyone who can hear the words of this psalm, which includes everybody in this room, is invited to look by faith and see with the eye of belief that God is going to do these things. This, this stuff hasn't happened yet. And, and we, as the people of God, we are those who believe that God is going to judge the world. God is going to bring, verse 8, desolations on the earth. And, and so we look forward to this day, and just as this psalm spoke to its original audience, who looked forward to this day, so also it speaks to us. We believe that God is going to destroy his enemies and purge the creation of every defiling thing. We see what God has done in the past. We look for what he will do in the future. And look at what is described in verse 9. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. The, the word here that's translated cease, it's the word from which we get the, the term Sabbath. So it's like God is going to put war on permanent sabbatical. And it's never going to come back. Now, how can he do that? How is it that God can say, War is going to cease to the end of the earth. Well, what he's going to do is he's going to make it so that everyone who refuses to repent, everyone who refuses to turn from whatever it is in the heart of man that says, I will conquer, or I will plunder, or I will, I will enslave other peoples, everybody that refuses to root that stuff out of their hearts, which, by the way, this is why we continue to need armies. This is why we continue to need security systems and locks on our doors and maybe even weapons at our disposal because there are, that stuff is in your heart. It's in everybody's heart. But, but the people who refuse to repent of that stuff, those people are going to be consigned to their permanent place of punishment and they will never again be loosed in the land. And everybody else, everybody that, that repents of all those impulses is going to be glorified and made new like Jesus, never again to be tempted by such impulses. So the longed for peace will finally be achieved. And the only people loosed in the land are going to be Christ-like. So there'll be no further need for locks on the doors or gates on the cities or weapons in the hands of the warriors. So look at what the verse goes on to say there in verse 9. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. God is going to destroy the enemies and the material with which they engaged in their revolt against him and his kingdom. So that when he issues the call for all war to cease, it will be accomplished. Never again will God's people be worried by persecutors and oppressors. Never again will there be somebody with a knife standing behind a Christian ready to hack away. Never again will God's people need to defend themselves in word. Won't have to make any arguments about the justice or righteousness of our our, our views. Never again will we have to def defend ourselves in deed. Never again will parents offer anxious prayers for the safety of their children. Never again will we have to endure an insufferable campaign cycle where flawed men vie to occupy the most powerful office in the world. There's going to be a king, and his name is Jesus. God's purpose at creation was to fill the earth with his image bearers, 
right? So he makes man in his image and likeness. And then he says to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And the reason God does that is because God wants his character to be reflected in those who bear his image in all places. And instead of filling the world with God's glory, Genesis 6, 11 says that men filled the earth with violence. When God puts an end at last to the violence, he will indeed be exalted among the nations and in all the earth. Look at verse 10. Be still. You don't need to strive anymore. I've done it all. Everything is accomplished. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God will be exalted. And then the psalmist confesses again in verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God's people will always confess that the best thing about them is that their God is with them and that their place of refuge, their place of safety is God himself. You know, we don't, we don't anticipate, maybe there are times when we're, we're, we're thinking the world could end at any moment, but we don't anticipate these things, do we? Th- those people in, in December of 2004, they celebrated Christmas on December 25th, never expecting that on December 26th, the tsunami would come and claim their lives. August 24th, A.D. 79, Mount Suvius erupted, and the town of Pompeii was buried under 13 to 20 feet of volcanic ash, and the inhabitants of that city, apparently all of them, apparently this this thing went down so fast that all these people, many of them were caught in the midst of what they were doing and, and just buried alive in this volcanic ash from which they did not escape. The end could come at any moment. In the flow of thought reflected in these psalms, the longing of the individual psalmist in Psalms 42 and 43 and of the community in Psalm 44, that longing is answered by the coming of the king in Psalm 45 who sets up his kingdom in Psalm 46. This is what we look forward to. And on this day... When, when this psalm is realized, when the things in this psalm are declared, the kingdoms of the earth will have crumbled. Everything that defiles the world will be purged. And this pure river will gladden God's city, the one that has foundation, where the things that cannot be shaken will remain. And so I say to you, on this day that we celebrate the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, just as we do every Sunday. I say to you that because of what Christ has accomplished, sin's warrant has been canceled. Death's power has been defeated. The dragon is dethroned. The serpent's head is crushed. The king died and rose. And Psalm 46 sings the day when he will establish his reign, put an end to war, burn its implements, remake the world, wipe away every tear, restore his people to life, glorify their bodies like his own, bring them to the river, and let them eat from the tree of life that stands on its shores. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would use your word to make us faithful to the day. And Lord, if there are those here who do not know you, I pray that they would fear the coming of your wrath. I pray that they would tremble at the word that will unmake the world. And I pray, Father, that they would humble their hearts and recognize that sin is lying to them, the devil is using them and exploiting them, And I pray that they would turn away from all these things that are ruining their lives and embrace Jesus, fall at his feet, recognize how trustworthy he is and what a great savior he is. And I pray that they would love him with everything they are. 
Help us, Lord, all to be this way. In Christ's name, amen.